friends, we are officially in the third week of Advent, uh, three uh, Sundays that we have opportunity to celebrate the coming of our incredible King. So just by way of recap, right? We've been talking about what does it look like to prepare the way for Jesus to come, to prepare the way for him to come to us so that we can receive the incredible gift that is Jesus Christ and to prepare the way to come through us so that everywhere we go, Jesus is born. So the first Sunday of Advent, you remember what we talked about? You were supposed to skip it. We talked about nothing. Good job, Lisa. Right? We talked about this, this invitation to skip it. Right? We're in Mark's gospel and skipping the stuff, skipping some of the gift giving, skipping the stress and the pretense so that we're able to get to the point and the way that we encounter Jesus and we bring him to others, that life-altering, history-changing, I've got a BC, and then there is this invitation to a whole life with Jesus Christ. And I've had a lot of fun hearing people. At a, uh, one, one family came and said, you know, this year I decided we normally spend a lot of money on Christmas cards. And, and I've made the choice. We're not giving them. Nobody's getting a card from this this year, and the money's going to Laurel House instead. I'm just making those choices to say, we're going to skip some things because we want to make Jesus known. Now, last week, we put a whole bunch of names, right, up here on the screen from Matthew's Gospel, and we talked about what's it look like to prepare the way for Christ to come by naming it, right? To name us, we need a Savior. To name our sin, the specific sins from which we need saved. And then to name the Savior. The one who came, who was born, in order to save his people from their sins. Well, this week, as we're talking about preparing the way, uh, I need a little help. And it's not even going to be from you. Don't look paranoid. It's actually going to be from, well, Charlie Brown. So um, if you would hit it, sir. Charlie Brown. <laughs> we'll just start it over again and let it keep going. Thank you, sir. So why should I tell the story when Linus can? So let me, let me ask you a question. There is actually a point in showing you this. What do you know about Linus? He likes his security blanket because he is insecure. <laughs> Linus, Linus is insecure. True story. Linus is afraid of his shadow, right? So he always carries his, his blanket. Did you happen to notice anything that happened with said blanket? Yes, ma'am. He dropped it. Thank you. Let me go ahead and show us that next picture. Right when Linus, who, if you are a Charlie Brown aficionado, you know that he and that stupid blanket go absolutely everywhere. I think it's surgically attached. But Charles Schultz, right, who is the creator of, of Charlie Brown and the Peanuts gang, he loved Jesus. And he's not a bad preacher, I must say, because Charles Schultz, right in the middle 
when, when Linus is telling the story straight out of Luke's gospel, and he talks about those angels coming and saying, fear not, Linus drops the blanket. And he doesn't pick it up again for the whole rest of the story. And I think that's a pretty good sermon. <laughs> See, in Luke's gospel, which is the gospel that we're going to be in today, three different times angels appear to Zechariah, to Mary, to the shepherds. And three different times when the angels show up, Lord, the, the angel looks at Zechariah, Mary, and the shepherds, and he has one thing to say. Fear not. Don't be afraid about what God's about to do. Don't, don't be afraid to prepare the way for Jesus to come. And I got to thinking about that, and, and Linus showed up in my memory tank, as I thought, you know what, Lord, if we're going to prepare the way for Jesus to come, probably we need to do the exact same thing that Linus did. We're going to have to drop our security blanket, right? Drop whatever it is that we grab hold of and we say, God, I am so scared of what you're about to do or what you might ask me to do or what the implications of this are going to be that we can't receive Jesus. You know, if your hands are filled with that security blanket and you're holding on to it for dear life, then the hands can't be opened to say, Jesus, I want to receive you or to give you. Instead, we have this amazing invitation from our God, and boy, is it a challenge to drop whatever it is we're afraid of so we can receive him. Now, Linus preached a wonderful sermon, Bridget. He really did, but he preaches it from a Christmas passage, and we're not there yet. We're in Advent. So we're going to back up a little bit in Luke's gospel, and I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Luke 1, verse 26 we're going to take a look at the angel Gabriel coming to Mary and seeing as, as the angel gives Mary this exact same command. He says, Mary, you got to drop your fear. <laughs> you got to drop it entirely if you're going to be able to prepare the way for Jesus to come. And I really just want us to walk through Mary's story. Now, my guess is that you're very familiar with it. Uh, it and the She's going to read it to us. If my guess is you're really very familiar with it, and as a matter of fact, if you are a female and you grew up in church, you put on a bathrobe at some point and you got to pretend to be Mary. Laura cannot figure out how to turn the Bible off. It's reading to us. <laughs> we'll mic it and it will read it for us. I bet we're familiar with the story, but I want to hear it today with fresh ears, see it with fresh eyes so that we can allow God to speak to us in our places where we need to drop the security blanket so we can join God in what it is that he's doing. So let's start in verse 26. We're going to read through 33, and keep your finger there because we'll come back in a few minutes. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words, and she wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You've found favor with God. You'll be with child, and you give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Now let's pause there. I want us to think about this for, for just a few moments, Nancy, from, from the perspective of Mary. Now, we know the whole story, right? We've seen it, we've watched it, uh, we've sung about it, but Mary didn't. You know, on the day that this happened, we've got a, a, a young girl, now, we presume, Ada, that Mary was probably 12, 13 years old. We don't really expect that she was much older than that. Now, in her culture, that made her an adult, but she's a young adult. we got a little girl here, teenager, who lives in the middle of Nowheresville. I mean, she grew up in the country, not where we would anticipate for any reason that God was planning on showing up. <laughs> and we've got a young girl here who is already betrothed to Joseph. 
right? Now, we've talked about this a little bit, but in a Jewish culture, to be betrothed meant she was married. The bride price had already been paid. The covenant had already been signed. The, the decision was made. Those two are absolutely committed to each other 100%. They just don't yet live together. And so they have not yet had sex. During that time period, there's this expectation. It's, it's Mary's own season of Advent. It's a waiting and an expecting for the day when she and Joseph are going to be living together under the same roof. So that means we have a young teenage girl who's got some hopes and dreams about what life's supposed to look like next. I bet she's got some fears, too. What's it going to be like living with Joseph? What kind of man is he actually? I bet she has plans for what it's going to be like to become a mom and to raise their child together of what their home's going to look like, of what her community's going to be, of having her mom nearby to help. And in the middle of all this planning, one day, out of nowhere, God shows up. And this angel looks at Mary, and he says to her, as she's quaking in her boots, Oh, honey, don't be afraid. God's got great plans. And then he explains them. And I, I I don't know. I don't know, Joan, that for Mary, they sounded all that great. Because this angel looks at Mary and says to her, so here's the deal. You're about to get pregnant. Like, now. You're about to get pregnant, and Joseph's not the father. And nobody's going to believe you. I mean, that's going to go over real big, right? You just, I mean, today it would be on, was it like Maury Povich show or something where they do the DNA testing? It's not going down. This angel looks at Mary and says, you're about to get pregnant today. You're going to look to the world like an unwed mother. And in a culture where adultery uh, is punishable by death, okay, death, not not the scarlet letter, by a big, long, drawn-out civil proceeding that would ultimately could lead to her being stoned in the middle of the street. If she's not stoned, she can pretty much guarantee that her family will be closing their door with her on the outside. That she's going to be ostracized, she's going to be cut off. That there is no way to explain this to Joseph in a way that he's possibly going to say, okay, that sounds great, let's you and me still get together. When this angel shows up in Mary's life, he's got news that rocks her world. And we know the end of the story, but she didn't. We know that she doesn't get stoned, but she didn't. We know that Joseph says, let's get married, and he takes on uh, all of the shame that she did, but she didn't know that. And so, Yvonne, I'm willing to bet (laughs) that Mary was scared. I I bet that she started to grab a hold of her equivalent of the security blanket and grab it really, really, really tight. And you know what? I think that she was scared, not even of those circumstances, I bet she was afraid of God. On the one hand, she's probably afraid that God is exactly who he says he is. You see, God says in his word that who he is is the God who when he speaks, it is. Right? You go back to Genesis. God said, let there be light. And there was. And if that's who God is, then if he says, let you be pregnant with my baby, then she is. That's terrifying. He really is powerful enough that whatever he says will come to pass. He's big enough that if he wills it, it will be accomplished. So she's not scared of circumstances. She's afraid of a God who can do what he says he'll do. And I bet she's also a little bit afraid that maybe, just maybe, God's not who he says he is. You see, Scripture says that we have a God who said, let there be, and it was, and then he stayed involved. We don't have a God, according to Scripture, who put the world in motion and then said, well, I hope it all works out for you. We have a God who has promised from Genesis on, right? When I speak it, it is, and I am there. I bet Mary is standing there for a moment, staring this angel down and going, what if God's not who he said he was? What if he's about to speak this into motion and then leave me alone? 
if that's the case, this isn't the greatest blessing there ever has been. This could very well be the worst nightmare she's ever stepped into, only she's not going to wake up from it. I'd be afraid too. And I don't know about you guys, but pretty much every time God invites me to be part of seeing his son born into the world, I get scared <laughs> about those same two things. Scared that he is exactly who he always said he was. Because if my God says, love your enemies, then he's the God who can cause me to do that, and I don't want to. If my God says, I want you to go and speak the truth in love to this person who desperately needs to hear it, then he can empower me to do that, and that sounds scary. If my God says... I am the one who can take your generosity and cause other people to be blessed by it, then he really can. And he really can get me to do that. And he really can use it. And I'm not sure I want him to. If my God says he's a God who can heal, he can heal me from the inside out, and he can use my story to help somebody else be healed, that's wonderful and true until I have to do it. Sometimes when God asks me to let his son be born into this world, I get afraid of who he says he is. And sometimes I get afraid that he's not who he says he is. That he's going to sign me up for joining him in his work and then sort of step back and say, I hope that works, let me know how it goes. But he's not actually planning to be there and to be present. You know, fear of God is as old as the garden. The first time the word uh, fear or afraid shows up in all of scripture, it's in Genesis chapter 3 verse 10. You know who Adam and Eve were afraid of? God. It happens after the fall, right? There was no fear before Adam and Eve sinned. But after they sinned, God is in hot pursuit of them. He comes to them because he always comes to his children. Only his kids are hiding. And God calls out to them and says, why are you hiding from me? And their response is, we heard you coming and we were afraid. Afraid that you are who you say you are, right? That he was holy and couldn't be in the presence of sin. Afraid that you're not who you say you are, because he'd said he was a loving and forgiving God. And they're about half terrified that he's not. You know, the whole rest of the Bible, over and over and over again, you read from that point forward, from the moment when Adam and Eve, when humans first got afraid of God, the whole rest of the Bible is filled with God saying to his people, don't be afraid. Don't fear me, because I am who I say I am, always. And you know, that's exactly what happens here for Mary. The Lord comes into her life, he totally interrupts every plan she has ever had, invites her onto his mission that sounds scary and dangerous, but says, Mary, don't be afraid, because I'm still who I say I am. Now, the next thing that happens in this story is Mary does what most of us humans do, at least us type A humans. I cannot speak for you type B humans. You are an anomaly to me. So maybe you don't do this. <laughs> Ashley's dying. She's so type A. She's worse than I am. <laughs> maybe type Bs don't do this, but type As, when confronted with something scary, we ask questions about a million. Because if we can ask enough questions and we can get enough answers, it's not scary anymore. Any type A's? You don't want to admit it. Thank you. Verse 34, Mary asks her question, right? She says, okay, Lord, this is scary. I want to trust you. I want to drop my security blanket and receive Jesus and be part of causing him to be born into this world. But you need to tell me a couple details. It seems legit. Verse 34, she says, how will this be since I've never had sex with a man? That seems legit to me. How on earth am I supposed to get pregnant? Right? So, so Mary comes to the Lord and she asks a how question. Right? Uh, maybe it's even a what question. What exactly are you doing? How will you be doing it? I can see where the questioning was going to go because I'm type A. When is it going to happen? Why? She's got a million questions. God looks back at her, and he says, Mary, you know what, honey? You're asking me a biology question. He gives theology as an answer. She asks a how question. 
And God responds with a who. See, he always does. Our God so rarely tells us all the details of the thing that we're afraid of. (laughs) He so rarely answers all the questions, well, this is what and how and when and why. But he'll always answer the who. Because the who's actually what we need. Because the truth of the matter is, I'm not afraid of the circumstances. I'm afraid of God. I'm afraid you can do it or you won't do it. So when the Lord speaks to her questions, he doesn't tell her, don't ask them. He doesn't say, you you should just have faith. He's just smarter than she is. And so he answers the real question, which has nothing to do with how this is going to take place. It has everything to do with who's going to do it. Who's going to be with her the whole time that she walks through this? So check out God's answer. Verse 35 says, The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Just hang there for a second. Guys, Mary asks biology. God does not answer biology. This answer to this question is not, how is she going to conceive uh, without uh, having had sex? That's not what he's answering. I don't know how he did that. You can ask him someday. His answer is theology. His answer is, Mary, you need to know that what I'm asking you to do, I'm going to be right here. And his answer is really important. Because it's not just for Mary, it's for you and for me. So, So let's pick it apart for a second. First thing he says is the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. I'll be honest, I read that and said, what does that mean? And why does it even matter? So I started poking around, and did you know that in the second part of Luke's gospel, also known as the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Chris, this exact same phrase shows up on Jesus' lips when he's talking to the disciples. When in Acts chapter 1, Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he's saying to this ragtag crew, you're going to cause me to be born into this world. You're going to go forward as my witnesses who make me seen and known and invite other people to know me. When he looks at that group of people, he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And then you will be my witnesses, starting in Jerusalem and to all the ends of the earth. So when God, through the angel Gabriel, says to Mary, Mary, this is, this is what you need to know. When she's saying, how? how? How exactly is this supposed to happen? And his response is simply, well, here's how. It's about the who that's going to live in you. So Mary's looking at the Lord going, I don't know how this is possibly going to come to pass, or I can possibly do it. And he says, oh, honey, this isn't about you. My spirit is going to indwell you and if my spirit comes upon you and indwells you then it's my spirit that will encourage you it's my spirit who will empower you it's my spirit uh, who will energize you and equip you to do anything i'm asking you to do so mary what are you afraid of so when the lord speaks that same promise to you and i and we come with our how and our what and our when and our why question carol says the same thing because jesus said it to the disciples He looks at us when we're looking at him and we're holding on to the security blanket. We're saying, I'm too afraid to do what it is you're asking me to do. And the Lord says, but you forgot who is going to do it. I will come. I dwell in you. I can equip you to do anything, including this thing. But then he goes on. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. not biology. (laughs) When the Lord speaks this word, he's saying something incredible to Mary that I have the feeling, Doug, she knew right away. Because he's quoting from what might have been one of her favorite hymns. God's quoting from Psalm 91. You have to remember that for for Mary, this young Jewish girl, the book of Psalms was was her hymn book, right? It was the equivalent of what got played on Caleb in Galilee some 2,000 years ago. She knew these songs, and that meant she knew Psalm 91. Psalm 91 opens with these words. 
She who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. The Most High is a title for God. And, and, and it means exactly what it says. It, it means picturing God as the one who is high, highest, as a matter of fact, who is lofty, the one who's majestic and glorious, superior and mighty compared to everything. She who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Think about that for a minute. You know, these... These psalms were being written, they were being sung by Mary in, in a desert. Is hot in a desert? There's not a whole lot of nice, beautiful trees. Anybody that went to Haiti, just get that picture in your mind. All we did was think, where are the trees? We need shade. So, Nancy, in, in this descriptor of God, you get this picture of God so, so big, so grand, so great. The sun beating on him but you able to stand in his shadow. She who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I'll say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. He will cover you. Or as it gets translated in Luke, he will overshadow you with his feathers. And under his wings, you will find refuge. That's a beautiful image. Notice the picture of, by verse 4 of Psalm 91, of switching to picturing God like he's a mother hen, gathering his chicks to him, sheltering them, overshadowing them with his wings, pulling them close and keeping them safe. So when we go back to the Gospel of Luke and we go back to Mary, right, and the Lord's saying to her as she's going, how is this going to happen? God's saying, who? That's how. Mary, I'm I'm going to indwell you with my spirit. I will empower and equip and encourage everything that you need. And I will not leave you alone. Mary, I'm the most high. I am bigger than anything that you're about to come up against. And I'll put my wings around you. I'll put my arms around you. Mary, I'm going to make sure that you are held safe in the shelter that is me. That's God's promise. That's the promise that makes it so that it's possible for Mary and for you and I to take the death grip off the security blanket, right? To begin to loosen that and say, God, I can drop my fears. Not because I have all the answers. She still didn't know what or when or how. At that exact moment, Kathy, she still did not know if Joseph would ever so much as look at her again. None of that had been taken away. But she knew who who was inviting her, who was going with her, who was going to empower her, and who was going to hold her. Because nothing is impossible with God. When you and I are invited by our incredible God to take steps into things that seem very scary, when we're invited to join him on whatever that next part of our journey is, and it's terrifying, We come at God with all sorts of questions. Uh, Line it up for me. Tell me exactly what we're going to do. And we can ask them all, but here's the deal. God's going to answer with who? He's going to look back at you and me and say, this is the one thing you need to know right now. You need to know that I will empower you. And you need to know that you can rest because the sun beats on me first. (laughs) I am the one who will overshadow you, who will hold you, and who will draw you close to me. That's what gives us the strength to do whatever it is we're invited into. Now, let's be honest for a second here. You and I do know the rest of the story. And so we, we know that Joseph chose not to divorce Mary. We know that they were able to come together. We know that Jesus was born. We know that God the Father protected them when Herod was massacring all baby boys under two years of age. We know that Mary got to watch her son grow up and become a man. We know all those pieces. We also know that Mary stood at the foot of a cross. And she did watch her firstborn son be brutally murdered. And in that moment, as she was saying to God, how can this be happening? And why did you sign me up for this? She heard her father whispering, 
My spirit is in you. And I am here to hold you close to me. Sometimes when God invites us to do things that seem very scary, he is not promising this will be easy, simple, or even feel good. He's promising who will walk with us through that. And because Mary said yes to Jesus' birth, and because Mary said yes to being held at the foot of the cross, Mary got to see Jesus be resurrected three days later. Those are all parts of our promise, too. Now, I know that Mary looked at, Jesus, looked at the Lord and that she dropped her security blanket. She dropped the fear because of the last thing that Mary says in this passage. God had shown up. He had rocked her world. He had made fear just strike right at her heart. He'd spoken the answer to the who. This is my promise to you. And then Mary responds to him. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And the angel left her. You know, Devin, the truth is that at any point, Mary could have said no. She could have looked back at God and said, your who answer is insufficient for me. It's lovely that you promise to empower and encourage and to hold and to shelter and to be present and that all things are possible with you. Find somebody else. She could have done that. When I was growing up, I had a preacher who would say, God's a gentleman. And by that, he did not mean God opens doors. He meant God takes a no. Because gentlemen do. If you tell a gentleman no, they respect that. God's a gentleman. He will never impose uh, anything on us. He will never come to us and say, I've decided this is what you're going to do, and now you have no will in this matter. I always have the option to look back at God and say, I am too afraid of you to join you in what we're doing. Mary could have said no at any point. But the moment that she looked at God and said, I'm your servant, Mary said yes. And she just she didn't say a tiny yes, Aaliyah. She said an incredible yes. Because the word that gets translated in most of our English versions as servant is probably better translated by an old English word, bond servant. See, a bond servant is somebody who is not brought into servitude or into <laughs> slavery. It's somebody who sells themselves. So a bond servant would come to a master and say, I sell me into your service. I'm agreeing to this. So when Mary makes that declaration and she stands before God and she says, I'm your bond servant, she dropped her fear. She stands before God with hands that are open and saying, I don't know what or when or where or how, but I know the who and you're a good master. And so here I am, whatever you want to do, may it be done to me according to your will. Friends, the day that Mary held her hands open before God was the day that she was able to join him in seeing Jesus be brought into this world. And you and I have the same choice, always. Right now, God is inviting you to do something in his world. He's asking you to join him in causing Jesus to be born. And my guess is that for at least some of us, we're afraid to do it. We got a long list of questions we would like God to answer. A long list of things we want him to guarantee. And God's looking back at us and he is saying, here's the guarantee. My spirit will come upon you. You will be equipped and encouraged to do anything I need you to do. I am the most high and I will shelter you. Those are his promises. That's his guarantee. And if you and I are willing today and we'll drop the fear, Jesus can be born through our lives. Let's pray together. This morning, as you come before the Most High, whose promises are yours because of Jesus Christ, I want to invite each one of us today, come before God, and if you need to come today and acknowledge what you're afraid of, to do so. I invite you to ask God to speak over you the same truth he spoke to Mary. 
But today would be the day that you release it. You drop your fear. Because you trust who God says he is. Father God, we thank you today that you are the one. You're the one who conquers our fears. Lord, we acknowledge before you what we're afraid of. Afraid that you might actually mean what your word says. Or where we are afraid, God, that you're going to leave us alone or turn out not to be good or not to be loving. Afraid that you won't be present when we stand like Mary stood and we have to watch something horrible take place. Lord, I pray for every one of us here today that you would empower and equip us because of the who to trust and believe every word you have spoken. Lord, may today be the day where we drop fear and we say yes. The day where we come like Mary with hands outstretched before you, saying, Lord, we've, we are your bond servants. We've placed ourselves in your care and in your service because we believe, believe that your promises are true. I thank you that you hear our questions and you let us ask them, but I thank you, Father, that you always answer by telling us who you are. God, may we become a people who know you even more, who trust you to an even greater extent, because we drop our fear. Thanks for loving us, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen.